I think maybe it's time to uh, introduce our speaker who uh, has uh, accommodated us uh, by staying up late. I think you're in an Eastern time zone, aren't you? Central. Employee at the US Agricultural, USDA Agriculture Research Service Station in Thad uh, Cochran South, Southern Horticultural Research Laboratory in Poplarville, that's Missouri. Um, prior to starting his position at TCSHL in early 2020, he was a research scientist and laboratory manager for the Bee Laboratory at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> Mike has also earned his PhD in entomology in the University of Minnesota and the focus on honeybee diseases. Uh, his current research focuses on the use of a uh, continuous cell line that he established from honeybee embryos to explore the effects of pathogens such as viruses and pesticide, uh, pesticides on honey health, honeybee health at the cellular level. Take it away. Um, yeah, thanks for the invite uh, uh, to let me talk to your group tonight. Um, and I'm not going to go a lot into who I am. You know that. But I'm going to talk about social immunity for honeybee health. Um, located in, in southern Mississippi, about an hour north of New Orleans, for reference. Uh, that's where the Poplarville Station is located. Um, it's a small fruit research lab, but I am here to study honeybee stressors. Uh, such as pesticides, especially in the context of small fruit. Uh, but I also do a lot of work in vitro systems, especially cell culture. And I'm also a hobby beekeeper. So if you go back to where I grew up, do a Google Earth search, a uh, small chunk of land in Southwest Minnesota, you can see my colonies from Google Earth. And here they are. Uh, I no longer can take care of them. I have my dad, he's my assistant beekeeper. Uh, he's my... Uh, always good to have an assistant. So immunity and bee health, you know, coming from Marla Spivak's lab, that's where I did my graduate work and postdoc work for several years afterwards. Um, you know, I have a foundation in uh, bee health immunity, but looking at natural behaviors that help support that health. Um, and, you know, I don't think any of us would be unhappy to see a colony that looked like this, right? Um, you know, boiling over with bees. And if you go into the neighbors, just based on the stacks, probably also full of bees, very healthy. Uh, and what we know is that oftentimes when you go into a colony, uh, you don't see this. And one of the main reasons is parasites and pathogens. And they're numerous, right? And there's many examples that we can... Um, look at, for example, immature brood diseases such as chalk brood, fungal pathogen. Here's a germinated nosema spore. This is an adult disease. Um, here we see the uh, uh, filament where it'll inject this nuclear material into a gut cell. Uh, it affects behavioral development, shortens lifespan of adult workers. And of course we have Varroa, uh, which is probably in the majority of colonies uh, and alone has negative effects, but when you put it in tandem with the viruses and vectors, uh, these RNA viruses, such as deformed wing virus. Here we see an adult worker with uh, malformed wings will have a shortened lifespan, not productive, also very common in honeybee colonies. So these burden of pathogens um, high abundance uh, is taking a toll on our colonies. So how can we look at the immunity uh, through natural routes, natural behaviors uh, to support bee health? Um, and for a pathogen or a parasite, you know, a, a, a honeybee colony is, you know, a, a smorgasbord, right? Uh, you know, you have a high density, uh, uh, of hosts, they're genetically similar, uh, and they live under stable conditions, uh, meaning they have temperature and humidity that's relatively stable. If you're a host and you can take advantage of that situation, you have access to numerous individuals. And when you're done with one colony, you can move to neighboring colonies. So, you know, it's an ideal world for a parasite or a pathogen, but it's not a free lunch. 
right? You know, bees have defenses and these defenses occur at many levels. You know, for example, you know, just nest structure, single defensible entrance guarded, um, the stable nest temperature, it helps some pathogens, but it also um, excludes other pathogens who may not be able to grow at that, you know, 34 plus or minus a half a degree brood temperature. Um, but there's also individual bee defenses. Um, for example, the insects have cuticle, like honeybees as well. And that cuticle is a physical barrier. They have blood cells. If you get into the body of the insect, of the bee, the blood cells, which are immune functioning, will recognize the non-self and attack those, such as bacteria, or here's a parasitoid egg. Um, blood cells are, are, are immune functioning. They don't deliver oxygen in insects. Uh, so this is uh, part of the immune response. There's also immune tissues. So this is a rather complex cartoon of the immune tissue response of insects and we'll see it in context of honeybees where you know pathogens and their signatures their structures are recognized by pathways in those tissues uh, and when they're recognized we have this cascade of molecular signals get turned on and off eventually leading to uh, production of antimicrobial peptides and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in my work, especially this pathway right here, uh, the immune deficiency pathway. But it's the pathogens itself that are recognized that become the, the triggers for these production of um, peptides that will actually then act against those pathogens. So we have structural nest structure defense, we have individual defense, but we also have the social immune defense, the social immunity. And this is where individual behaviors, some individuals perform uh, behaviors that lead to a group level immune defense. And not all will perform these behaviors, but it's their products of that behavior, which will reduce transmission to many, to the group. It may result in some costs to those that perform those behaviors, uh, but the benefits for the many will outweigh those costs. And if we think about it, if we can you know, take the investment of our own individual immunity, uh, that's a costly system. It takes a lot of energy to, to fight off pathogens and parasites. But if we uh, spread that investment out to the entire colony where only a few individuals will, will, will perform, for example, propolis collection or hygienic behavior. If that can reduce the cost of me as an individual uh, who will benefit from the actions of the others, uh, I can then devote that energy to other things such as foraging, for example, or um, if I'm a queen, reproduction, uh, or care of my nestmates. So these costs show up for individual immunity, a shorter lifespan, reduce productivity. And if we amplify that at the colony level, we have um, uh, premature mortality of the colony, less honey production, for example. So how then does this social, can we support the social immunity um, such as propolis collection um, or hygienic behavior? Uh, and then ask questions at the individual level to see how uh, the social immune response benefits the individual immunity. And this is where I use uh, my research. Uh, again, thinking about social immunity, uh, one example being hygienic behavior. Here we have a honeybee colony where we have the freeze killed brood. This is a test for hygienic behavior where the brood is frozen, returned to the colony, uh, and after a period of time inspected, and we can see that the dead diseased brood had been removed by the workers of the colony. So they're detecting uh, a, a disease situation, uh, and freeze-killed brood is a proxy for that in this case. But you can imagine this being a pathogen-infected brood or a mite-infested brood 
where the workers come along and they are the individuals, not all of them in the colony, but some are assuming the cost of exposing themselves to disease, uh, removing disease, and that will then benefit the other nestmates. And we can propagate that trait. This is a natural behavior. So we have hygienic behavior assay. We can test for that behavior and we can compare you know, a highly responsive colony to maybe one that's not so responsive. So if the brood was removed uh, for this same amount of time in this colony as this colony, we'd say that this one is more hygienic. Um, eventually this colony will remove the remainder of these dead brood, but this colony is quicker to respond. So we can say, hey, this is a trait that we may, if, you, if it's something that you wanna consider for your beekeeping, may wanna propagate. So that's just one uh, form of social immunity, but there's also another form in uh, resin collection or propolis, where some individuals, not all, will forage for resins, such as from poplar trees. And they gather those resins, sticky material, bring it back to the colony, unload it. Some other individuals may mix that resin with wax and the colony is sealed in an envelope of resin as well as cracks and crevices. And here we see a high amount of propolis on the top bars. It becomes a pain to manage as a beekeeper, right? A lot of propolis, but there is a benefit. These bees are collecting a material that they're not consuming. Uh, so there's no nutritive value to that, but there is a value in other forms. These resins contain terpenes and polyphenols, uh, such as flavonoids. And these are bioactive compounds that will um, lead to uh, a modulation of the immune response or other physiological processes such as detoxification. So these resins also have direct effects on uh, pathogens, B pathogens. They have antimicrobial compounds. And there is diversity in resins. So not all resins are the same. You know, for example, the resin or propolis down here in Mississippi is not the same back in Minnesota in my home state or in California. And there's probably seasonal uh, differences in the abundance that can be collected. But the overall message is that resins have antimicrobial properties, um, either directly or through effects on the immune system that are not uh, well understood at this time. But we do know that bees and colonies that have a high amount of propolis have a lower resting immune expression. So they're investing less energy in their immune expression in the absence of a pathogen, pathogen challenge. But when you introduce a pathogen into an environment of colonies where bees have been living in this propolis rich world, they are able to mount a more robust immune response. There's some additional evidence that propolis may also help stabilize uh, core bacteria, uh, the microbiome, especially like on the mouth parts, for example. And as I mentioned earlier, these resins help with uh, modulating immune responses, detoxification, antioxidant mechanisms. Um, so resin collection, we know also that you know, the activity against pathogenic fungi and bacteria. But as I pointed out earlier, there's a lot of viruses that you know, the mites can vector when they feed on bees. So is there activity against the viruses in this case? Um, in human and veterinary uh, medicine, we do see evidence for activity of propolis resins against uh, viruses as, as potential therapeutics, but not as well explored in the honeybees. And this is where I like to come in and use a different type of system to study um, how propolis could affect a honeybee immune response. And that's by using a cell line. Here is an image of honeybee cells. These are cells growing in a flask uh, in an incubator in the lab. Uh, and if we're here is a cell, here's a cell, here's a cell. So this is a field, a confluent 
um, solid lawn of honeybee cells. And this is a continuously dividing cell line that I established about 10 years ago now. Um, it has its own history. I don't have time for that tonight. It's an interesting uh, 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 topic on its own and how uh, the cell line, these are cells growing in flasks, um, came into being. It's the only one that currently exists. And if we think about human medicine and animal medicine, uh, there's a large variety of cell lines that are used to study and develop therapeutics, for example, of cancer research uh, at the cellular level. And this is the example for the honeybee world. So this is just a nice picture of uh, hundreds of honeybee cells. There's a green filter here to help with the contrast. But the cell line, the name of it uh, is Apis mellifera embryonic 711. Uh, AME 711 started in July of 2011, and it's still going, it's still living. Uh, cells that I originally isolated in 2011 are, are growing to this day uh, from those uh, parental units. Uh, and here's just an example of, of that division. You know, here's one cell after 40 minutes, you can see that it's become two cells. So it's uh, an active growing culture. But I can use AME 711 to study cellular immune processes in the honeybee system. Go back to that image of um, uh, immune cascades where pathogens are recognized by the cell and we turn on those molecular switches leading to the production of antimicrobial peptides. So what happens then if I introduce a virus into that culture system? such as the form wing virus or acute bee paralysis virus. Um, and just as a, as a side note, you know, these are really interesting um, microbes. RNA viruses, they don't have a DNA genome, they never have a DNA intermediate even. It's just a strand of RNA. And even those simple are able to overcome and take advantage of its host once it gets into the cell of its host and use host machinery to make more copies of itself based on this strand of RNA and a protein coat. Uh, so my idea then was to, well, so if I can get these cells to produce an immune response, um, what happens if I add propolis to the culture medium, to the medium that the cells use to, to grow in? I then can quantify the effect on those immune uh, uh, genes in that system, uh, comparing it to the control and an ethanol control, uh, which is used to dissolve the propolis and then a propolis uh, treatment group. I can also inoculate cultures with virus, pure virus, expose them to propolis to see if that propolis has an effect on the, the, the replication of that virus. So pretty, pretty simple experiments here. Um, but if I first look at the effects on the immune system, if I add propolis to the culture system alone, do I see changes in these molecular elements to that signaling uh, cascade? For example, do I see changes in the receptor that will recognize the pathogen? Do I see changes in the transcription factor that will talk to the nucleus and get it to produce antimicrobial peptides. So if we look at just the receptor to start with, this is peptidoglycan receptor protein. This is in the cell membrane. It's in the cell membrane of my honeybee cells in the culture. If I add propolis to the culture system and then measure the amount of PGRP at certain intervals over time, this is hours, uh, do I see a, an effect uh, on its expression? So if this is the amount of expression relative to an untreated control, we'd say at time point zero, our untreated group given nothing, our, our group given the solvent, the ethanol, which is used to dissolve the propolis, 
and then a source of Louisiana propolis extract and Brazilian propolis extract. You see at time point zero, they're relatively equal. And over time, all of them seem to increase. But at 12 hours, I have almost twice as much PGRP pro, uh, gene product in my propolis treated groups. So it looks like the cells are responding to the presence of propolis in the culture medium by making more of the gene that could be used to make the protein for the cell membrane that will recognize the, uh, the pathogen. Well, let's go downstream of that then. Look at the factor that will talk to the nucleus to make more antimicrobial peptides. So this is relish. This is a transcription factor. Um, it will locate, it will into, it'll translocate into the nucleus uh, when active, and it will uh, lead to the production of antimicrobial peptides. Again, 0, 3, 6, 12, and 24 hours of exposure to the different treatments, in relatively equal amounts in these early time points. And even at 12, a little dip in the solvent control. But notice at 24 hours, really dramatic upregulation in the amount of relish being expressed in the propolis treated groups. So we see a change in the amount of gene being expressed for the receptor and a change in the amount of gene being expressed for the transcription factor. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, in both of these graphs, you get this sort of, even in the untreated, in the solvent control, you get this upregulation yep. at, at three and six and even 12. And then it looks like it gets heavily downregulated at 24 in this, yeah. in this experiment, though not yeah. where you didn't run to 24 in the other one. So yeah. I was just wondering what, what's going on. Right, right. No, that's a great question. So is it part, part of the, the is, it, is it cycling of the cell in addition? I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, we see increased expression, but then, you know, at 24 hours, we go back to almost the baseline levels at zero, right, for the untreated. But we're seeing a maintenance of uh, relish, relish, relish expression in the treated groups. So what, what's maintaining that expression is, 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 is what I, um, I don't know at this moment. I don't know what's maintaining this level of expression. Um, I thought, you know, but then looking at, you know, if you look at the antimicrobial peptides in the next figure here, you don't see any change, really. You see, uh, you know, relatively um, um, minor expression, I would say, compared to control in all the groups. So, you know, we're seeing um, um, an effect on the receptor and the transcription factor. So I don't know if it's the, the propolis is helping um, create, set the scenario for more of, the, of the, the background that will lead to transcription. For example, if I were to add a pathogen, would this help then in this situation, uh, would we see upregulation in the antimicrobial peptides? Um, so that's a great question. Um, but, you know, I did try to, to challenge these cells then with putting in uh, a virus. So if we're seeing these effects on those, those members of that signaling cascade in the presence of propolis, would that help against viral replication? And to do this, um, I had to come up with an inoculum of virus. Um, you know, several years ago in my cell culture system, I did have some contamination come in uh, and I was able to isolate that contamination and, and do a series of tests to show that it was acute B paralysis virus. Uh, and this virus, when I would add it to healthy cells would, would pretty much destroy them in a timely manner. So this is a little bit grainy of a picture, but here we see my honeybee cells uh, at magnification. And when I give them a dose of this virus, um, I'm able to wipe out 
you know, uh, a population uh, within a relatively short period of time. So this is the, the 50 percent uh, inhibitory concentration, the lethal concentration, I'll say. And if we see here, this is prior to um, inoculation. And then after, this is the same image. We see these, if you look at this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, after exposure, they're gone. Those cells have been lysed uh, and I can see an amplification of virus in response to that. So it's a, a nice way then to say, well, if I can affect the immune response in the presence of propolis, will that lead to a reduction or inhibition of viral replication? Um, and no, my answer uh, would be. So here again, the same time course, and I'm adding acute B paralysis virus to the culture system. And we have our untreated solvent control, the Louisiana and the Brazil. Notice that over that course of time in the presence of propolis, uh, a very nice amplification of virus. Those cells are producing a ton of acute B paralysis virus, uh, and they're also dying too, uh, uh, if I were to take this out a little bit longer. Um, but notice across the top here in the dotted line, there's something I didn't uh, uh, wanted to hold on telling you is that my cell line is persistently infected with the form wing virus. Um, my healthy cells, um, if you go, go back to that image of that green field of nice healthy cells, those cells are carrying a high load of the form wing virus, but they're not uh, showing any kind of uh, negative effect, uh, at least visually. So my inoculum, when I add it, contains relatively equal amounts of acute B paralysis virus and deforming virus. Uh, but regardless of the amount of deforming virus I add, its levels will stay unchanged over time and uh, the amount of uh, treatment does, that I throw at them. Uh, can I ask another question? Sure. Does, DW, does DWV um, reverse transcriptase into the nucleus or is it present in the cytoplasm or what's yeah. the deal? Great, great question. We don't have any evidence that it's, you know, into the, it's been integrated or is in, in the nucleus. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a study that needs to be done, though. There's no evidence that we know of, uh, but um, that, that, that's something that I, uh, would, uh, would, I'd like to, to have a more firmer answer on. As far as I know, it's, it's no, though. Uh, I have a question too. Um, sure. Michael, I might have missed it. What is the origin of these this cell line? Yeah, no, it's uh, honeybee embryos is the original origin. Oh, so um, it's just a mixture of all embryonic tissues. Yep, yep. Uh, it it was difficult to when I first tried to establish it. Um, you know, you know when when I started as a graduate student, you know, I take on a little sidetrack here. Um, I was working with Nosema and. Nosema is an intracellular parasite, uh, and um, you know, I, I, at that time, I came from more of a, of a, 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 a mammalian research side, and I thought, you know, everything had a cell line <laughs> at the time, and I didn't realize that honeybees had no cell line, and that was troubling to me, and uh, so I wanted to establish it, and, you know, Nosema is a gut pathogen, so I thought I could get from gut cells, but that's a messy system when you're taking it from an, uh, an organism that has a gut. Uh, so I went right for the embryos uh, and because they're easy to sterilize on the surface. Uh, uh, so that, that is their origin is, is embryonic tissues, but it's, it's a, a, a mash of, uh, of those embryos. Not but how do you, how do you ma maintain it so that it's a cell line, like essentially it's immortalized, right? Yeah, right. No, uh, so immortalized, uh, so it's continuously dividing those cells. Um, you know, it, it just took a lot of trial and error as far as setting up the primary cultures and creating conditions that were would support, uh, at least for the first part, um, uh, 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 a viability. Cells were, would remain viable in that culture environment. Uh, and that was just a matter of, 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 of temperature, uh, the right amount of, 
uh, of, of serum, um, which is often uh, uh, not as variable, but creating the right uh, culture medium, uh, pH, uh, salts, amino acids. So they're not in, they're not infected with anything to make them become no uh, to to transform them to immortal no uh, it was just uh, and you know you might maybe maybe it's the form wing virus that was a has a transformative effect I don't know uh, maybe that's what is sustaining their their uh, 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 immortality. Um, but it, you know, and it wasn't that every primary, you know, I set up at least a hundred primaries to get to one cell line. Uh, I guess the reason I'm asking is because I'm curious, like how close is this cell line to what's actually happening in the actual bee? Uh, um, how, how so? Can, can you expand on that? Uh, well, if it's if it's yeah. been going on for generations and generations, is yeah. it possible that it's changed at all? Um, oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah, I see. Is it removed from the original, like that original primary culture, for example, which is more uh, close, is probably the best approximation to the to the organism, right? Um, has it changed so much from that original um, isolation? No, that's that's. That's that's a great question. That's a common um, argument uh, against continuous cell lines as being, you know, are they too far removed from what uh, is the natural host response in this case? Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, great question, and I I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but as far as you know, using it to, you know, um, seeing that it can at least produce a response, an immune response. I mean, these these are immune responsive is is in, interesting to me. Um, but I'd have to then compare to go back to those primary cultures, setting up primaries to see if they also have similar properties to the whole organism, or to are they more aligned with the cell line. No, that that that's a great question. But in this case, if if we if these cells are are far removed or not, it, the the propolis doesn't seem to have an effect on um, on the viral um, um, uh, infection process. And in fact, it's a nice test of the system to show that you know I can grow virus uh, 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 relatively easily in the cell line, and I can even isolate that virus uh, if uh, and look at other ways to knock it down. You know, I, I tried to you know going back to trying to recreate a, a, a real world scenarios where the virus may be exposed to propolis. Um, you know, trying exposure to volatiles. Uh, here we see I can increase the concentration of resins in that culture medium, for example. I'm limited by the amount of exposure uh, before it becomes toxic to the cells. But here, if I can expose the virus itself uh, to a high amount of propolis, in this case, volatiles, here we see a pool of virus. Uh, with uh, a high concentration of, of, of evaporated propolis uh, and letting those volatiles, uh, well, one, can they get into the, uh, this little bit of medium containing virus and then putting it back into the culture system. Uh, that was not effective, but there may be a way to put direct contact. You know, you know if we think of propolis as, a, as an aseptic surface, I mean, it has a volatile component, but what happens when you add um, a virus onto propolis? Does it at least uh, inactivate some virus? Does that help reduce some of the viral burden uh, in, for example, a contaminated cell uh, or surfaces that bees may uh, ex be virus exposed? Right. And that's something that I would like to try in the future. I just, 
this this sort of raises a whole other question. Yeah. What? And I don't know the answer. I have no idea what the answer is, but you might know. What is the actual transmission mechanisms for these viruses? Yeah. So, for for like for deformed wing virus, one of the the routes of transmission would be through the varroa mite, for example, right? So the that's varroa like, would pick up. That's like a that's like a direct injection mode, right? Yeah, right. So it feeds on an infected bee and then infected uh, immature, for example, and and uh, will move it to uh, another bee. Uh, there is some evidence of 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 queen to offspring transmission, right? Where uh, queen will infect uh, eggs. Uh, that she lays. Um, so that's one way, but you know, if we have some feeding going on, I don't know that there's much fecal oral transmission. Um, but the varroa mite vectoring is a, is a is is a way of moving it uh, um, horizontally. It's not obvious. It's not obvious how propolis would influence that. Right. No, you're right. But if there's, if there's, if it can help, let's say there is virus contaminated material, if you're handling, you know, during the removal process as a, as a worker, you know, they're chewing down the pupae. If they're infected, if there's material that could be contaminated um, mm -hmm. with virus particles, for example, you know, I was, I was just kind of curious if the, if, you know, you know, the, Propolis has this volatile properties. Is that is that act as a as a surface sterilant? Um, um, it, it was just a, a an idea uh, that I guess I, I thought I would. It's probably not the uh, the main way that propolis would act on virus, but it could reduce some viral load. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that. Um, well, I, yeah, okay. I mean, I understand you're asking a more limited question, and that there's a ton of questions, right? That this just no. brings up. No, you're you're right, and I'm just trying to, you know, and maybe you know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe, maybe I'm trying too hard to see if propolis has an effect on virus. <laughs> um, it it might not, right? Um, whereas in these other pathogens, such as fungi and bacteria, where you know you have um, um, diseased, uh, uh, where you had the potential to spread disease, uh, rather, uh, externally, meaning like, you know, the virus is being transmitted kind of internally through the varroa feeding or, uh, queen to egg, uh, where if you have chocolate, where you have active cult cultures growing on the surface in, into the, we could have uh, not so much aerosolized pathogen, but more direct contamination of, of nest materials. So these, these propolis looks like it, you know, going back to this cell culture system, you know, it could have some effects on the immune expression, but not so much on the virus and the culture system. Um, so, you know, exploring the effects of propolis is just, you know, one direction for a honeybee cell culture. Um, but if we look at and think about, uh, there's other uses for this cell line, such as, you know, looking at effects of new or existing pesticides, which, you know, in our hive environments, which are um, contaminated with a lot of uh, residues, this may be a way to, um, um, see maybe increase the specificity of those pesticides or you know, look at more of the cellular health effects of those pesticides. So, um, and another thing here too, and I think this goes back to, uh, uh, touches a little bit on some of the questions and maybe in my situation, I'm using too much virus uh, for my dosing. Um, acute bee paralysis virus is rather lethal um, uh, and it takes a little bit to cause a lot of an effect. Um, and I don't know that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that a B, you know, you know, what, what is a dose that a B would experience in a hive environment? Uh, that's a, a question that, um, uh, that I don't know an answer to, but maybe if I scaled back uh, and tried a different amount of virus, maybe lower, uh, uh, medium and a uh, high amount, just to see how uh, this would affect uh, in the presence of propolis. Uh, but again, you know, propolis is whether you support it as a beekeeper or not, um, you know, there's some health benefits to its presence. Uh, and those health benefits, you can increase or some, uh, uh, help bees gather more of it uh, through different mechanisms, just traps or, or roughing in, you know, woodenware, and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how you can not necessarily uh, let bees put it everywhere, but maybe direct it, such as, again, in a trap or some surfaces are roughened and see how that would help uh, with colony health. So I think I'm getting close to the end of the time and I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to skip over, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place with this. I think I'm gonna stop it right here. Um, uh, and take some questions on uh, the use of propolis or as a social immunity in, in the cell culture system uh, or other other questions on, on social immunity. But I appreciate the time and I apologize that I, I wasn't able to share my screen right away. Yeah. Well, thank you for an interesting program. Um, I do have a question. Um, yeah. When you're uh, dissolving the active uh, component out of propolis, um, mm -hmm. well, I, what I have found personally when I scrape propolis and throw it in a, a jar and add some, uh, some alcohol from the hardware store uh, and mix it around, um, I get a brown liquid and I get a bunch of sludge left, left over. Um, are you sure all of the active components are in the brown liquid or is there stuff left over in the sludge or are there ways of um, dissolving um, more of the sludge than, um, than just the alcohol? Right. Um, I, I've, it, my experience has been when I've you know, tried to dissolve propolis in, for example, my, my solvent is always ethanol. Um, and that sludge material um, could be, you know, debris and, and, and wax. Um, uh, I find that when I, if I chill my propolis extract, that some of that wax will precipitate out and I'll get a, a cleaner preparation. Um, um, I know that different solvents may be able to capture some, some other, um, 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 bioactive components. I don't have a strong background in, in the actual chemistry of that, but I know that you, you know, for example, there's uh, methanol extractions, uh, which probably are a little bit more, um, not as easily accessible to, uh, for, for beekeepers. But I think the majority of that is, is captured in like a, a ethanol solvent. Okay, it didn't occur to me that uh, there would be that much wax in the uh, propolis that we scrape off of our, our hives. Oh, off the hives, yeah. Uh, there, yeah, you'd be surprised though. I mean, I, I know the propolis that I have scraped off, um, there's, there's, some, there's a good amount of, 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 of wax in there, not so much, um, um, in, less so than there would be on like the edges of the frames and stuff like that. But. Um, but if you if you try chilling it once, see if that'll help. Um, um, I know you want to capture more of that stuff in the sludge, but I don't. That that could be. Um, well, if it is wax, that would explain why it's not very soluble in much of anything. Right. I have added a bit of um, gum turpentine, mm. uh, which I understand is a um, part of a formula for making a. A, a polish 
using beeswax. Mm -hmm. So maybe that accounts for a little bit more of that stuff being uh, dissolved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Um, yeah. Should we not be pulling the propolis out of the hive and leaving it in there? That That's always a, a, a question <laughs> that, you know, it, I think it depends on your, your what are your goals as a, as a beekeeper, right? I mean, are, are you, you know, how much propolis are you willing to tolerate in a colony? Um, if you, if it's, if it's really bothersome, um, maybe encourage them to place it in, in, in uh, certain locations or uh, focus their, 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 their propolis deposition. So, for example, you know, propolis has these benefits for the colony, not, not so much that we see in the viruses, right? But, you know, they have benefits on, you know, against bacteria and fungi that are pathogenic. So if you want the benefits of propolis, maybe try trapping uh, and, and maybe that'll help them place it, uh, focus their attention on where to place it. Um, so that, and not saying that they won't put any on your frame edges and you won't ever have to use a hive tool again, but you know, it, it may help um, kind of, uh, again, uh, uh, localize it. I mean, it's, a, it's got, uh, um, um, good properties for the uh, bee health. So um, you may consider leaving it as much in as you can. I've so never I, had, I've never really had very good luck with getting them to put propolis anywhere. I've used, um, you know, if you put number eight hardware cloth over a ventilation hole, the bees will fill it mm -hmm. instantly. Right. But I've, right, right. I've tried lining the hole inside of the hive with that and they don't, they don't cover that with propolis. I've tried using a, a wire brush on a drill to really scratch the inside of the hive and they don't put propolis there. <laughs> you know, just... I've, yeah, right. And I've tried that too with the with a wire brush and I've not not had as good a success. Um, and I think maybe it depends on the on the on the the size of the of the of the, of the crevices and cracks. Uh, maybe they have a, a um, uh, a, a limitation or like a, it, it, they, what am I trying to say? Uh, certain uh, depths or roughness is what will stimulate them to deposit it. And maybe the steel wall just doesn't uh, uh, do as good a job as, as, as motivating that behavior. Maybe. I really thought the number eight hardware cloth would do it, but yeah. that didn't either. So, you know, to me, I think they're probably not going to come in contact with those ends of the bars or ends of the frames where they usually put it. I don't think they come in contact with that that much. Hmm. So yeah. I, I scrape that off and actually then apply it to the inside of the hive oh, or wow. at least to the uh, landing board where they have to walk over it. Um, and then I do steal some of it for myself too. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a that's an interesting uh, use of of saving from one area and putting you know not just discarding it uh, makes management easier for you, but it also you know the effort they put in the collecting that material uh, is pretty significant, right? So there's like I said, there's a cost <laughs> for those individuals to collect that material, uh, just like honey production, right? I mean, how many bees does it take to make all that honey that we harvest? Uh, you kind of don't want to abandon it as much as let them use it for there's a reason why they collected it. Right, exactly. And so do, do we know exactly why they put propolis on the ends of the bars on top? What's the point there? Uh, <laughs> ah, good question. Um, I think it's just probably more a matter of the, of the, of the, the, the cracks and the crevices again, the, uh, trying to seal up um, um, irregular formation. Um, uh, yeah, you know what's interesting? This last weekend, I was doing my last check in my hives, um, and there was I have a couple of colonies that are amazing propolizers, and I'm actually breeding for propolis production. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have some super yeah. great propolizers. And I, I was actually doing that with the propolis. I was cutting it off the end bars and putting it inside or taking it for myself. Yeah. And the bees ran over and started trying to collect the propolis from there. I wonder if they're actually banking it there. Interesting, interesting observation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if I put if I put out old beehives, that's that's what they're going to rob off. I mean, first thing is the honey, but then they go and start picking at the old hives and and taking all the propolis, and huh. you find bees always harvesting propolis off of old hives and old frames. Yeah, so uh, great Michael- propolis off of uh, some frames and and have it laying out in in the yard on my tray. Uh, I'll see bees come and visit it and take away b- bits of it. Um, I, I've also um, been in the habit of, of making that uh, propolis wash and painting the inside of boxes, the undersides of top covers and so forth. And someone mentioned that they thought that they had heard that propolis declines in its um, uh, antiviral, antifungal, you know, antipathogenic effects with time. Is that known to be true? Uh, yeah, I believe that there is some evidence that there's a, a uh, there's a seasonal, you know, there's there was a seasonal effect of the propolis in some of the studies I've seen, and I don't know if they maybe thought that it was had to do with either the the change in the bee population over time, or pe- perhaps maybe that maybe that the volatiles um, uh, had had um, what are you trying to say that. Um, uh, dissipated from that material, and there, there hasn't been a renewal of the propolis during a period of dearth, for example. Um, so there, there could be something to do with that. But I do like the idea. I've not done this, and I know uh, one of Marla's students. You know, when he did his studies, he he painted uh, as you did the inside of the boxes with a propolis extract and let the ethanol um, uh, evaporate. Uh, so he, that's how he did his studies to show that he could enrich the, the environment with propolis compared to uh, the control. Uh, so that, that's an interesting, um, um, uh, a nice application of it. Well, I just wonder how often you have to renew it or should yeah. you, or, or can you count on it having infinite shelf life? I don't no. know if anybody's tested that. Yeah. yeah. I doubt it's infinite, but I, you're, you're, it's a, it would be a nice study to see, you know, how, how long does it last, right? So nobody knows, no published data on that. I suppose you could do some, you know, you can try and grow in some, um, <clears throat> um, some chalkwood in there, for example, without the presence for, to see if the volatiles are active uh, uh, over time. Hmm, that, I might have to try that out. <laughs> you gave me an idea. <laughs> is anybody doing uh, like mass spec analysis of propolis to find out what all of those compounds are? Is that information available anywhere? Yeah, uh, Marla, one of Marla's students uh, a few years ago had done that, and he was able to um, he he was able to take propolis from the colonies. Um, how did he do this again? His name is Mike Wilson. Um, and if you look up uh, University of Minnesota B Lab, you might be able to find some of his research. Um, he he would sample from the plant sources themselves, for example, poplar trees, uh, and then he would um, collect uh, the resin from the foragers, and then he ran it through mass spec, and he was able to compare um, the signatures of the of the tree source and uh, uh, the res- and resins. And uh, I don't know if he got to the point where he could identify the actual compounds that were, you know, had the highest activity, for example, but uh, he was able to aden- at least identify compounds. One would wonder also in different parts of the world, uh, obviously the bees collect propolis, but the sources of those propoluses are, are different. One right. wonders if the profiles have any similarity to each other. Uh, that might be a clue as to what the active ingredients are. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I think if I remember too, that Mike did a, you know, did a study where he would take 
um, you know, and this was in culture. This wasn't in, you would grow, um, like, you know, I, I think it was um, AFB, for example, in, in pure culture, but expose it to, and Minnesota sourced American fall brewery and, and then expose it to Brazil propolis or um, um, Nevada, I think was one of his sources to see if there was maybe uh, an effect of uh, regional sources on maybe a strain of AFB. So that's uh, that's kind of a way to, to look at, to see if, um, you know, bringing in or, um, you know, is, is there, um, is it strain specific uh, activity? Is, is there an estimate of how many different compounds there are in propolis? Oh boy, uh, yeah, thousands. I, yeah, no, yeah, that's a. Uh, I wish I was Mike Wilson right now. <laughs> he did some. Well, nice we'll stuff. have to have him as a guest. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I don't know if he still. Um, you'd have to ask Marla, um, um, but I, if I could also send you a link to some of his his papers and stuff. Oh. Oh. So. Hey, Mike, you mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, aerosol, I mean, uh, you know, the um, volatiles. Have yeah. anybody tried, you know, making this into an, an aerosol of, of some kind and, you know, uh, you know, vaporizing it and, and spreading it, you know, using one of like the mineral foggers oh, in yeah. and spreading oh. it through the hive? Is that is that like a good inoculation or is that just overwhelming <laughs> oh boy that's a that's an interesting idea um kind of like a, a like oxalic treatment or uh or like like you said one of those those, those vaporizers huh i wonder how one thing is you'd have to get the material in in liquid form which would require the solvent right and yeah. i don't know if the solvent would do more harm than the um the propolis huh well they got those insect foggers that you know heat it up sure. and spit it out and it puts it out as a cool fog sure sure um yeah and i suppose if you could taper back the dose you might be able to to spread a lot of propolis and then spread a lot of volatiles with with not much propolis if you if you know what i mean um you, know, you can you know get a large range of exposure Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. You guys have great ideas. I have to write these down. <laughs> well, well, like Tina, I tried to uh, uh, raise some propolis myself, and so I, uh, I yeah. just stapled a window screen, basic window yeah. screen on the inside of a bunch of hives. Yeah. Um, I used some some new stuff, and I used some really old ragged stuff. You know, I, that had been sitting on windows for 20, 30 years, so it was good and oxidized. Right. And they, um, it made it made beekeeping a little bit more difficult. Uh, that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> yeah. the edges snag and everything else. Yeah. Um, but after two years, some some of them they didn't touch. Um, right. But it was the old screen that they actually did something with and so after two years one of them has got a fair amount of propolis on it um you know and they started around the staples um where the staples where the, where there was loose and billowing on the side they didn't touch it but where it was stapled on they they filled that up so so yeah i was gonna say too you know, it might not be that all colonies um collect uh, a abundant amount of propolis right you know yeah. just like the hygienic behavior you know, unselected colonies, you know, that level of high responsiveness is, is rather rare, right? Uh, just like I would assume that propolis in unselected colonies, uh, you see a, 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 a variation in, in response. Uh, so yeah, um, so they did, they did, in your case, some colonies put in a lot on that screen system. Yeah, it finally, finally took them a while to fill it up, but yeah. So do they pack the propolis more in the upper and the supers, or do they put them mostly around the, the brood chamber? I mean, obviously it'd probably be most beneficial around the brood chamber. Yeah. And, you know, I, my experience has always been that, you know, that's usually more around um, um, corners, frame edges, 
um, some of the smaller entrances, you know, like the little one inch entrances or whatever. Um, but I'm, maybe I don't have my supers on long enough to get them to put a lot of propolis up there. Um, I don't see a lot of propolis in my supers, uh, to, to be honest. I had an interesting experience with propolis. Um, a friend of mine made me for a present um, a really nice horizontal hive, and mm. the, the the slats that were the the um, the ceiling had um, about two or three inch ventilation circles covered with screen, and it was really clear that the girls did not like to be that well ventilated, and they were plugged with propolis within two months of um, putting the bees in the hive and getting in the hive really going. And they never changed it. They did not want the, the, um, the ventilation there. And um, I'm not exactly sure what the material in the screenage was, but it was absolutely plugged with propolis. And um, it, I'm not a really, proponent of horizontal hives because I don't think the ladies like to live that way. Um, but I, I thought it was quite interesting that um, they, without a doubt, just closed off the act. And it wasn't like that was exposed to the um, to the outside. There was a, a roof over that, um, kind of like what you see in the um, in the magic hives with the um you know with the little tin roofs and things like that it, it, it they um there was a solid roof above that slat and it, the idea was that you could pick those slats up and go in at any point in the hive and and examine you know the the frames below it and it was made up with langy frames um, but they did not like it, and it was absolutely solid propolis. So, and I, um, I wasn't into understanding the effect of it in the hive, but um, I just thought it was interesting. No, oh, thanks for sharing that. That's a nice. Uh, did, so, did did you leave the propolis where it was at? Then did you? Uh, did you, did you when when the girls build it they want it right and they're females and you leave it alone so yes <laughs> i left it there you know i mean it's a lot of effort to gather that material right i mean it's and they're not eating it so it's got a it's got a purpose for the colonies so my, my, my thought is, you know, yeah, it's, it can be an annoying on the edges of frames to get frames out sometimes, but, you know, they put the, they're putting that effort in. I'd like to think that, boy, it, it's, it, it's, it's more than just sealing cracks and crevices, right? It's helping to maintain a nest uh, microclimate. It's helping to inhibit pathogen growth and maybe stabilize core bacteria so yeah, try to leave it as best they can. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's you know I, what I thought was interesting was that you know we talk about stabilizing the environment inside, mm -hmm. and we also talk about um, the, the the you know the water that we get in there that drips down on the you know and the when the girls can't handle the amount of um, um, moisture in the honey that they're um, evaporating and but they did not want they did not want it going out the top they those things were those things were solid and um and actually you know i what i thought was that, that wouldn't be a bad deal if indeed you were into um uh, nurturing it and um and harvesting it is to put that and it was fine screen it was it was not like it was a window screen and i i don't know if it was metal or plastic i never really uh, was paying much attention at that that was kind of an early time in my regeneration as a beekeeper and um it was just a um a curiosity that, that i noticed 
So, um, and uh, um, there certainly is a market for propolis, but you know, that's not something that I'm going to tackle. <laughs> well, speaking of that market, um, I, I know there is one, but who buys it and why commercially? Any ideas? Yeah, herb, herbalists buy it right. so that they can make tincture for human use, use as a, a, a medicine for humans. And the people here pay $40 a pound for clean propolis. Um, an old time beekeeper in the Mount Diablo Club told me a story once about, um, he, he apparently was young enough to remember World War II. And he said, uh, because he lived in Eastern European Europe at that time, uh, all the medications were uh, commandeered by the, the German military. And the only thing available to civilians was anything out of the beehive, particularly propolis. Well, let's see, I get, I get $20 a pound for honey and $40 a pound for propolis. So I know where I'm going to put my efforts. <laughs> well, uh, bees will produce a lot more honey than they will propolis. Indeed. Right. Quite a lot easier too. So, and I just saw a study floating around that propolis is uh, effective against COVID. Yeah, there, there's there's examples of, of like, a, that's what kind of led me into the, you know, does, does it, they have activity against the B viruses because you do see these examples in, um, you know, human and, and veterinary medicine, you know, some of the phytochemical research um, activity against, um, um, for example, some herpes virus. Uh, I'm not sure my dentist would like me um, trying to use it, however. <laughs> Well, the uh, brand of uh, toothpaste Tom's from Maine, they have a line that has propolis in it for your toothpaste. So they're applying it to your teeth if you use their toothpaste. I just put a little pinch between the cheek and gum and it lasts all day. <laughs> yeah. I'm, jam I'm, I'm jamming it in some old toe fungus that an ex-boyfriend left me with. Seems to be working. No, I, I've heard that it's good against, you know, like a nail fungus. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Ratchie uh, made a tincture and puts it in a spray bottle and she uses it for rosacea on her face and she uses it as a throat, you know, if she's feeling dry in her throat or she's got a sore throat and she says it works. Wow. Well, I've been um, speaking about toothpaste. Um, I have been uh, experimenting with uh, chewing gum with the propolis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so um, you know, chewing gum. And then I uh, put a piece, I always say about um, a small piece of a, the, because I've been, I collect the, um, the propolis um, and make a ball and put it in a car and have them driving and chewing and then get a little piece of mix with the gum and then chewing on that. Uh, I, don't know, it's been only about a month or so. So uh, my dentist will, my dentist is the beekeeper. I turned him, I turned him into a beekeeper. So it's been three years. So he, I told him what I'm doing. So where every time he's checking, he's checking my gum and he seemed to be a little better. So I don't know whether that's a coincide with the brushing better or with the uh, propolis, I have no idea. But probably six months, the next February, is going to recheck and then see. I will consistently continue to do training on it to see what happens. Are 
Either that or he's going to be whitening your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> We're just. <laughs> Well, I, I guess you know. I, I guess there's nothing to lose, huh? Or where, 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 if I come in and then talking like, a, oh, hello everybody, and I think there's something happening to my teeth, and then I think that might have caused some effect on my teeth. And, then, uh, and I think that's gonna have an effect on your TikTok popularity <laughs> too. <laughs> well, I don't know. They they might go viral. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. Well, thank you, Michael. This was a really great talk. I enjoyed listening. Oh, thank you. And I, I appreciate all the comments and questions. They're very good. I, I like, and I like your ideas. It's, it's, it's great to, to talk to a new group. I am not, I know very little about California. <laughs> so uh, it's great to be able to, to enter into your beekeeping world for a couple hours tonight. I appreciate the invitation. Yes, thank you so much. Really informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep up the good work. I hope your bees are all doing well and healthy.